Welcome, everybody, um, to another GC GLC at lunch. Um, very proud to have Ernesto Mercado um, Montero here as our fellow, and I'll introduce him in a moment. Uh, I want to say a couple of things uh, about the GLC real quickly. Uh, we're very proud that tomorrow night in New York City uh, at uh, actually Trinity Church in lower Manhattan, a grand old historic church. Uh, we are doing our annual Frederick Douglass Book Prize Award Ceremony in person for the first time in three years. And our winners are uh, Taya Miles for her book, All That She Carried, uh, shared this year with Jennifer Morgan, her book, Reckoning with Slavery, also a book about the Atlantic world. Uh, anyway, uh, and a lot more going on at the GLC. Uh, any of you uh, who are not on our newsletter, which comes every week, usually on Tuesday, please just let us know today. And a quick 10-second uh, shout out to everyone in the Spartan Nation. I'm a very proud graduate with two degrees at Michigan State, which is having a very rough week. Um, just wanted to say solidarity with all the Spartan Nation. Anyway, all right. Uh, Ernesto Mercado Montero is currently a Mellon Fellow and now uh, a budding assistant professor at Dartmouth College, Dartmouth University, sorry, up in New Hampshire. Uh, he's only here for one month, which is a shame. We'd keep him longer if we could. Um, he's a historian of the African diaspora, diaspora, especially in the Caribbean, but in some ways of the full Atlantic world. Um, he was born in Bogota, in Colombia, uh, moved uh, to the Caribbean first, uh, and then as a teenager to Madrid with his family, where he was an undergraduate at the uh, Complutense University in Madrid. Then he came to the United States, did an MA at uh, State University at Buffalo, and his PhD at UT Austin which is a, a great department in all things Latin America, Caribbean, Atlantic world. They have some really good people there. Um, now, his work uh, is currently a book about the Antillean geopolitics in the period between the Spanish, and get this chronology, folks, the period from the conquest of Puerto Rico in the 1510s, so the early 16th century, all the way through the French Revolutionary Wars and the whole revolutionary epic in the 1790s. It's a project that particularly uh, illuminates the Carib Indian uh, society, the role of the indigenous Carib people in the story of the establishment of colonialism in the Caribbean. And as I understand it, and we, we had one great lunch last week, uh, Ernesto's work is trying to see this history of the collision of Africans, of indigenous people in the Caribbean and of these European empires as not exclusively a story of oppression, destruction and loss, but of a kind of entangled histories. Uh, that has not always been the case in this field, and especially uh, his work on the Carib peoples is not easy to do, but it turns out here at the Great Beinecke Library and other places, Ernesto is showing that the archives are not silent on this. Uh, they're not silent at all. It's not easy to find sources on the Carib peoples, but he has found them. Uh, so uh, th they were, it turns out, uh, intrepid seafarers, uh, warriors, uh, and even good diplomats <laughs> in these first encounters of Europeans with the indigenous peoples of the Caribbean. Anyway, Ernesto, I'm going to turn it over to you. We'll have a 30, 35 minute talk. And as usual, I hope a rich Q&A session. We've got a great turnout today. So Ernesto, welcome again to the GLC. And over to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, David, for such a nice uh, introduction. Of course, I, the, first, the first thing I want to do is just 
to say thank you not only to you, David, but to everyone here at the GLC, Michelle, of course, you, David, Melissa, all the other fellows been fantastic, making you know, my time here just amazing. I feel very welcome. Uh, working in such a great environment is always inspiring. Uh, well, I'm going to share my screen. I have a presentation. Feel free to post uh, questions on the on the Q&A. Uh, it's going to be around 30 minutes, 35 minutes, and then we go to what I really like. That is like the, the Q&A, the discussion that is where we uh, engage with each other. So let's go. Okay. So, uh, well, the title of my presentation today is The Black Carib Archipelago, Afro-Indigenous Power and Autonomy in the Early Modern Caribbean. I'm doing a little bit like a, playing with this word. There is a recent amazing book by Tessa Murphy that you may know. The, the Creole Archipelago is mostly cent centered in these islands. Uh, while I'm doing something not it's kind of similar, but I'm centering my study on these Carib or Black Carib people in the geopolitics of, of this entire archipelago. Um, I'm going to start with an overview of what is going to be my presentation today. Uh, well, I think that David already introduced some of these topics, uh, the things I'm going to emphasize right now, right here. Uh, the first one is that, uh, well, this is a studio of Antillean geopolitics that starts in 1510, 1515s, when the Spaniards, uh, Ponce de Leon, arrive in Puerto Rico and conquer this island and extends toward the 1790s when we have the French Revolutionary Wars and the age of revolutions in the Lesser Antilles. But not only the Lesser Antilles, France and the Atlantic World, this is, this, I may put the, these Carib people in conversation with all the, revolutionary movements in, in San Domingue, in Spanish Terra Firme, and so on. Um, what are the main, the main points I, want, I, I do with this book project? Well, first of all, I demonstrate that the Carib people, or this community of Black Carib, shaped the early modern tilts as much as Spain, England, Holland, and France. The Caribs were able to integrate themselves into Atlantic politics and economy. And responding to the demands of colonialism, these Carib people, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about the Carib, Black Carib, all these, these things, but just keep in mind, Carib and Black Carib people evolve into independent slave traders, smugglers, and prolific planters who integrated themselves in the Atlantic economy. But first of all, let's talk a little bit of who are these Carib people, right? They were, first of all, the term Carib is not like a pre-contact identity, but actually a term that originated in Columbus diary. And this appellation was uh, intrinsically linked to cannibalism. It was a myth that the Spaniards used in order to enslave these indigenous people in the Antilles who were allegedly cannibals. So they were only fit for enslavement. Right, but at the same time, well, uh, this is an appellation that the Spaniards especially use for every indigenous people who resisted the Spanish expansion. So this moniker actually does not convey the complexity of the cultural complexity of, of these indigenous people in the Caribbean. But at the same time, I use it because it's an ethno-political category that we cannot dismiss. Has tremendous performative power and political power, especially when you take a look at and do research in these different colonial archives, you realize that being a Carib is, is a tremendous, tremendous, uh, has tremendous implication. And the map that I'm showing you guys here is the map of the indigenous Caribbean. And this is the space that the Spaniards encounter when they arrive to the Antilles. It's an extensive, like, uh, archipelago of different indigenous groups which had extensive chiefdoms in Cuba, Ajiti, nowadays Haiti and Dominican Republic, Borinquen, Puerto Rico, Jamaica, the Lesser Antilles, we have the so-called Caribs, but actually also in Northern Tierra Firme, where is today Venezuela, Guyana and Suriname. Uh, sorry. 
Let's move, let's move on. So who are these black Cari people? So in the early 1700s, my study focuses on, I see my attention from the entire archipelago to a concrete set of three islands, namely Dominica, San Lucia, but especially Saint Vincent. And why I do this, because this is the space of black Carib ethnogenesis, the formation of this new ethnicity of black Carib people. And I incorporate, who incorporated Africans in their polity through captivity, captive taking, marriage, and ritual adoptions. So why I center on these three islands? Because this allowed me to, demonst to demonstrate two things, basically. First, uh, how the black Carib shaped the patterns of European occupation and regional geopolitics in the Lesser Antilles in this, in this 18th, 18th century. And second, how unlike other native groups in this zone, the Black Caris were active participants in the African slave trade and plantations economies. And the map I'm showing you here is the 1725 Dodge match of Cannibalum. Again, the Spaniards were not the only imperial power playing with the trope of cannibalism. We have the Dutch, we're gonna see later the, the French, uh, also the English and British later on. Hmm? And this is the structure of my presentation today. I'm gonna make a few remarks on my methodology and sources. And then I'm gonna go like strike forward to my academic, to the academic significances of my research of my book project. Okay, the methodology. Okay, so let's let's keep in mind that the Black Carib culture, these Black Carib people, they don't leave like substantial writing materials behind. In this society, memory and orality were the main components of history. So the main challenge of, of making this type of, of work is making sense of indigenous and Afro-Indigenous work using mainly European sources. But still, there are ways to make it. There are ways to make it. And how I engage with this problem. I employ a Landure and trans-imperial methodology of cross-checking and contrasting Spanish, French, and English official and missionary sources as the most effective way to recreate this Afro-Indigenous world. The Black Caris' political motivations, the nature of their slave markets, and the strategies to navigate European colonialism. Still, when you go to the archive, and you work on these sources, you find some explicit Black Carib voices. And this is one of the documents that I found here. This is from the French archives. And um, this is a letter from General Joseph Chatoyer, 1795. Let's keep in mind that the Carib leaders were polyglot and cosmopolitan people who instrumentally embraced the European, European legal traditions of writing documentation. In this case, Chief Chatoyer is using the discursive rhetoric of the French Enlightenment to express his alliance to France, to the French Republic against Great Britain. What are the historical or uh, historiographical or academic significance of this project, this book project? I will say there are mainly five. The first is geopolitics. Second, political economy of smuggling and the slave trade. Third, Ethnogenesis and the African slave trade. Fourth, political history of the, Cari of the Atlantic War, the Caribbean. And five, and lastly, hemispheric black liberation. And the image I'm showing you here is a portrait of these black Carib people by Agustin Brunias, more or less the 1780, more or less circa 1780. Let's go ahead with geopolitics. And I'm showing you here, this is a present day map of the Antilles, Northern Tierra Firme and the Greater Antilles, a little bit of Puerto Rico, Haiti, Dominican Republic. And what are the points I want to make here? But we cannot fully understand the geopolitical configuration of the Caribbean without the Caribs and Black Carib people. This book demonstrates how Black Caribs forced Spanish, French, and English to occupy a space within limits in the Antilles. Let's be concrete. Three centuries of Carib control over different islands explain why the Spaniards were never able to extend beyond Hispaniola, Puerto Rico, and Tierra Firme. Why the English centered their colonial enterprise in Barbados, Jamaica, and the Leeward Islands, and why it took France almost two centuries to expand beyond Martinique, St. Kitts, and Guadalupe. 
So today, this region might be a little bit peripheral in global affairs. There are small touristic islands that we all want to visit some days and you know, have a great time there with our friends and families. But keep in mind something, from the 1500s to the 1700s, this region was a of critical and crucial political events. The slave trade and plantation economies in these regions propel Spanish, English, and French, and Dutch expansion and colonialism in the Americas and beyond. Something I want I do with this research is like centering a little bit like this illustrating the transition from indigenous slavery to African slavery. So we go back to the early stages of, of, of Spanish imperialism in the new world. The Spaniards launched dozens of slaving armadas to the entire Silicon Caribbean in the 16th century. Each of these enslaving expeditions captured between 200 and 900 slave Indians. Spanish trade indigenous slaves were massive. Only Columbus exported some 2,000 Amerindians, 2,000 to Spain. And by 1542, there were about 10,000 enslaved Indians in the Iberian Peninsula. And we have, of course, massive like uh, human loss of the Taino, so-called Taino Indians in Hispaniola, in the Lesser Antilles. And keep in mind something, we have, for, for example, around 1,500,000 Taino Indians. We have 40,000 Lesser Antillean Caribs. And London's population at this time is only 50,000 people. So keep in mind these numbers to look at the, the proportion of the magnitude of this type of slave trade. And the map I'm showing you here is the map of Caravana, again, playing with this uh, trope of Carib cannibalism. In This is by Bartolomeo Olives, 1580. But uh, as David said in the introduction, this is not a story, but the people has masterfully demonstrated this, people like Ernestone, uh, did an amazing job demonstrating how these Spanish people enslave Amerindians and had these uh, networks of, of slave trade, indigenous slave trade in the Atlantic world. But this is a story. I don't want to portray a story of Spanish superiority necessarily, but when one where the Carib people were able to manipulate colonialism and drag somehow the Spaniards into the deep indigenous world of raiding, barter trade, and captive taking. Uh, the Carib were located in the center of maritime currents connecting Europe, Africa, and the New World. This is crucial. They had the technology and geographical mobility to confront European armies. And this is illustrated perfectly in these two images. The first one is European codices that show a little bit of how this, uh, the Carib race to the uh, European uh, armadas and, and, and vessels. Of course, you can see again, the trope of Carib cannibalism. And then you say the pirogues de la Marguerite. Uh, there are these ships, these Carib pirogues that carry out of 50 warriors and they were able to move around the Antillan archipelago, raiding the Spaniards, raiding the English, raiding the French, capturing enslaved people, capturing European people, kids, women, and incorporating them into their societies. The geography were again, from Puerto Rico to what is today Venezuela and the Northern Tierra Firme. Something else I want to show you is the geopolitical consequences of this sort of like carib raiding and captive taking. While the Spaniards were not able to span beyond Puerto Rico, Cuba, Hispaniola, and present day Venezuela. Some people portray that the Spaniards really were not interested because there were not gold there, but archival documentations demonstrate other things that they try but they were repelled by these so-called Carib people. Mm -hmm. The same Ponce de Leon had uh, an armada trying to control uh, Guadalupe. He was repelled by these indigenous people. And the consequences, of course, the Carib dominion over the archipelago that extended from St. Kitts to Grenada. And the image I'm showing you here is like a, one of my favorite maps of the early modern era. It's some sort of like a mapa mundi made by Juan de la Cosa. And Juan de la Cosa is a very interesting figure because he was with Columbus and he was the captain of the Santa Maria, one of the ships that, as you know, came the first uh, Columbus uh, expedition to what is today the Americas, the Caribbean, okay? 
But if we zoom in in map, in this map is Juan de la Cosa, I, I will invite you to make an exercise of interpretation. You see here is the Caribbean, the Tropic of Cancer, you know, the, 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 the Spaniards climbing spiritual possession over this territory with this image of the Virgin Mary and baby Jesus. But at the same time, you see the flag of the Castilian Leon kingdom there claiming possession of this territory. If you see up here, you, you also see the Tropic of Cancer down the Tropic of Cancer, the Islas de Caníbales. So the Spaniards ever since Juan de la Cosa, 1500, they were already portraying these islands, the paradox claimed by the Spanish crown, but dominated by these so-called caníbales, these so-called Carib people. The second uh, in thing I want to talk about is the political economy of smuggling and the slave trade. And to introduce this topic, I want to talk about the story of Nicolás de Cardona. Nicolás de Cardona was explorer, and this story started in Spanish explorer. This story started in 1611, when the Spanish crown granted a group of investors the monopoly, and I quote, to discover the pearl fisheries and find the lost ship of General Luis Fernández de Córdoba in the Atlantic, Pacific, and California. In 1613, this the investors prepared a fleet of six vessels commanded by Cardona. The fleet sailed from Spain in July 1613. The explorer visited Barbados, Guadalupe, Puerto Rico, Grenada, San Lucia, San Vincent, Margarita, Hispaniola, Jamaica, and Cuba. The image I'm showing you here is the front, the front uh, of, of this uh, work that Cardona drafted upon returning to Spain, titled Descripciones Geográficas e Hidrográficas, Geographic and Hydrographic Description, which is a detailed account of this, uh, the, of, his, of his voyage that included maps, painting, detailed observation of the people he encountered. This is by Cardona again. Um, he observed that in Dominica, Martinique, San Lucia, San Vincent, and Guadalupe were populated by Caribs who, and I quote from his own work, raided the Spanish outpost in Tierra Firme and Margarita, capturing Africans and I quote, killing and enslaving Christians. Cardona encountered a Carib islands where Carib people were developing markets of European commodities, food and slaves in exchange of machetes, fish hooks, knives, wines and guns. This story illuminates how the Caribs were somehow Africanizing the Caribbean. They resemble independent brokers, like in West Africa, who established a slave market with diverse people like the Dutch, French, English, and Spaniards. In the case of Cardona, he bought 28 blacks to the Caribs to work as divers for his expeditions. And the Spaniards also bought two mestizo children, I quote again, sons of Dutch or French with Carib women. And this is an interesting aspect illuminating how this Carib archipelago was also like a stage of symbiosis and cultural transformation between Africans, Europeans, and indigenous peoples. But again, the Spaniards were not, all, were not the only clients of these Carib markets. We have this image here that illuminates how the uh, Filibus Terres Caraibs uh, from the 17th century that illumin illuminates like the transactions that these people had also with the French. move forward. But again, uh, the story is much more complex because these Carib people adapted their farming tradition to the exigencies of, the, of colonialism. Mm -hmm. They had much more to offer than European merchandise and slaves. They had adapted their farming tradition to the colonialism, developing their own farmer farms, what I would say that were as some sort of avant la plant plantations. And we can talk about that in the Q&A, of course. The gender character of farming is playing why black caribs, raiders prefer female over male captives. Women were in charge of the carib gardens, making cassava bread that they later sold to some European explorers. There were increased agricultural productions empowering carib leaders who access to European commodities, guns, knives, to barter trade. And my point is, this is not, it, the lesser Antilles were not like the useless islands that the Spaniards were like portraying, but vibrant centers of intercultural contact and trade controlled by Carib Indians. But most importantly, the Carib dictated the terms of trade, developing their own farms and a slave market with diverse European agents. The third point I want to make, ethnogenesis and the African slave trade. 
And then we move here to the 18th, 18th century. And at this point, as I said before, my work focuses on three islands, Dominica, San Lucia, and San Vincent, which are the space where the new, this new ethnicity emerged, the Black Caddies. In the early 18th century, the Caddies evolved in a peculiar slave society, participating in the African slave trade, but also incorporating African people in their families. And this study to demonstrate the transformative character of African slave trade in the American societies. By the 1720s, the Caddies massively incorporated black people. In this, in this period, as I say, a new category emerged in the French documentation and, this, and the British one too, in the English, the black Caddies. And we're seeing here is the consolidation of an Afro-Indigenous society. Slavery was also a catalyst of a revolution in the Caribbean where people develop economies of taste consumptions in Europe and the Americas. Sugar, coffee, tobacco became commodities of massive consumption, as the images here illustrate. The first, Jonathan Thayers and his family in 1740, you can see their attire, they are consuming tea, like uh, in the European way, if you may. And the second illustrates how Black Creole people in Martinique also participated in these economies of consumption. But of course, this is not like a fairy tale of, Afri of, the, of the African diaspora. We have the other side, that is the tremendous suffering and violence of these plantation societies that emerged in the Caribbean. This massive production, of course, was resting in the backs of Black people enslaved in this space. The Black Carib people were part of this hemispheric tradition of indigenous slavery, like the Comanches, Apaches, and Tupis were able to, the Black Caribs had the geographical mobility and power to raise and develop their own slaves markets. They developed regional and trans-imperial networks of raiding and African slave trade. They captured Africans in English, Dutch, French, and Spanish plantations to sell them to other Europeans. And this pattern of raiding, captive taking, and slave trade exacerbated in moments of political contentions and Euro Caddy warfare. And I say, this is, of course, uh, the moment where this new category emerged of the Black Caddies. And of course, we, we need to remember that this Afro Indigenous society had these inclusive notions of kinship. So every person can be a caddy thing to trade and ritual adoption. Uh, and this Afro-Indigenous uh, slave society was the center, was emerging the center of the Caribbean plantocracy. And just to give you some numbers, in 1780, San Vincent Island, the British estimated, had like over 5,000 Black Caribs, 1,200 Africans living among the Caribs, and only 1,200 Anglo settlers. So if we make numbers, we have a majority of Black people and free Black people living in this uh, island and the image I'm showing you here is Chip Chatoyer again, the person who I showed you the letter before, with his family. So say like the, this this society was like a society where polygamy pol, polygamy was accepted. Chip Chatoyer with his wives and kids. Um, so the point I want to make is like by centering the study of the African slave trade on the black caddies, we're able to do three things. The first, illustrating the transition between indigenous and African slaveries. Second, examine the role of African slave trade in forging new societies in the Americas. And lastly, and equally important, undermining essentialist views of blackness and indigeneity. We have the consolidation of a black indigenous society in the center of the Caribbean plantocracy. My fourth point, my fourth uh, academic contribution will be political history of the Atlantic War. My research demonstrates that we cannot understand the complexity of crucial political moments in the Caribbean without the Caribs and Black Caribs. This is not a story dominated exclusively by imperial competition, but one where the Black Caribs developed instrumental political alliances with English, French, and Dutch. These alliances ultimately shaped the outcome of Atlantic conflicts. And which, which are these conflicts concretely? The Spanish conquest, the second Anglo-Dutch war, the American revolution in the Caribbean, 
and the French Revolutionary Wars in the Antilles. And the, for, for the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to focus on the Second anglo dutch War, 1666-1667. And let's keep in mind that, uh, just to make a long story short, the, the Carib people allied, different Carib factions allied with the English and with the French. They fought against each other and the outcome, the outcome of the con of conflict was, of course, like peace, but also how indigenous people and Europeans like engage in these uh, some, some sort of uh, treaty making in order to in order to consolidate their sovereignty over these concrete islands. And this is the document I'm showing you here right now. Is how it demonstrates how actually the Caribs uh, embrace these legal traditions and. Um, in 1660, uh, this is a document, a group of influential Carib leaders from Dominica, St. Lucia, and St. Vincent signed this treaty of peace with England and France. And this, this concrete document like was endorsed the recognition of St. Vincent, Dominica, and St. Lucia as Carib sovereign dominions. But at the same time, of course, the Carib were, were recognizing the English and the French presence in the lesser Antilles. So this is like a two a two way route. Something I want to show you how this um, uh, like Euro Carib uh, treaty making and diplomacy reflected, for example, and this is one one of the most interesting examples uh, that how reflects in cartography in European cartography. And this map I'm showing you here is the Archipelag to Mexique uh, by Vincenzo Coronelli, 1688. And just one decade after the end of the Second anglo dutch War. You see, this is a much more elaborated map, uh, I would say more accurate, quote unquote. But if we zoom in, in this map, you see this. And this is one of the particularities of this map is that it's a detailed map where coronally depicts English, French, Dutch, and Spanish possessions with specific settlement dates. You see a little bit of, of this here. This map also reveals sovereignty over concrete islands that coronally label Le Ile Carib, the Carib Islands. If we look at Dominica, for example, up in the screen, we see how coronally portrayed the Caribs as I quote, the greatest warriors in the Americas and the Caribbean. So again, we're, we're seeing how this reputation of Caribbean people and the performative power of their indigeneity reflected not only the documentation, their ability to deal with the different European powers, but also in cartography. And this status that they achieved through treaty making and their sovereignty and, their, and gaining well, recognition of their sovereignty over this island remain practically unaltered until the end of the Seven Years' War in 1667. So what are the points I want to make here? The point is that this is not a political history of the Atlantic War dominated exclusively by imperial competition, privateering, and European mercantilism. The story of Northern European occupation of the Caribbean is more complex than established narratives where English and French occupy the peripheries of the Spanish and Portuguese empires. Instead, we have a story of intercultural warfare and diplomacy. We also have sovereign Afro-Indigenous polity, and a sovereign Afro-Indigenous polity empowered by raiding, treaty making, and political alliances with Europeans that ultimately shape the outcomes of important political events. And lastly, this is the last uh, in academic contribution I want to uh, highlight here for you guys. It's something that I call why well, we move to the age of enlightenment, come with me to this, to this era. So interesting, right? And we're gonna talk a little bit of how I find here are like the, paradox, the paradoxes of enlightenment, of enlightened liberty and the French revolution. This is a story of paradoxes. I, I, I want you to, to keep that in mind. So we are familiar a little bit with the story of Haiti, Saint-Domingue represented, or not only Saint-Domingue, the French Atlantic War in general, represented in this image from Paris, Moi, Live, Aussi, I'm Also Free, that illustrates the significance of emancipation for Black people in the French Atlantic. 
Yet, by focusing on the Black Caribs, this work offers a counter narrative of the impact of enlightenment on Black societies and the Atlantic world. This is a story of paradoxes where enlightened ideas of liberty and inclusive citizenship were detrimental for ancient regime polity of African descendants, the Black Caribs. The French contemporary abolition of colonial slavery in 17, 1794 undermined Carib political power that rested on, as we know already, warfare, raiding plantations, taking captives, and the slave trade with the French planters, for example. In other words, with universal freedom, there was no room for the Caribs traffic on enslaved Africans. The Black Caribs were unable to repel attacks who defeated, the, who defeated them in 1795. At least 3,000 Caribs women, children, and men were imprisoned, taken captives by the British. And the British took the drastic policy of relocating them by force, forcibly, the entire Afro-Indigenous community to Honduras. But why Honduras? Because Spain was now supporting France against the British, and the British expected that the Caribs would become a major problem for the Spanish authorities in Central America. So, to summarize, in sum, we have a geopolitical history of the Caribbean where an autonomous Afro-Indigenous society was crucial in at least three aspects, I would say. First, shaping the patterns of European occupation, Spanish, French, English, or British. Second, developing autonomous smuggling and slave trade markers under their own terms. And third, shaping the course of Antillean geopolitics via warfare, treaty making, and the slave trade. Well, thank you very much. Well, Ernesto, thank you. Uh, uh, we welcome all your questions, folks. We've already got a couple very good ones that have come in, and I have a couple. But I'm going to start with the question that has come from the audience, or one of them. Uh, this comes from Richard Turrets. Um, when, if ever, did this? This is for you, Ernesto. When, if ever, did Carib become a self-identity? Is is it? Is it discernible, you know, in chronology? Was there a confederation or an alliance of some sort? The question goes on across the islands. Um, uh, when did they distinguish Black Caribs from Africans so distinctly as you found in St. Vincent? Uh, in other words, there's a, a bunch of questions here about this growth of a Carib and Black Carib identity wow. over time. What more can you say about that? Yeah, of course, that's a great question that actually is, is, is taking me still uh, work to discern, but I can say something. Uh, of course, it was an imposition, but like most, like uh, many of the, many of the uh, indigenous peoples in the Americas, we say the Comanches didn't call themselves Comanches, for example, and the Apaches and so on. Yeah. I can say that uh, by the time when the French and English people arrived in the Lesser Antilles, early, early 17th century, they were already portraying themselves politically as the Caribs. Mm -hmm. And the Black Carib category emerged in the archive, emerged in the archive in the early 18th century. When you say like this, these colonial like concerns that there were like too many Blacks among the Indians among the caries or the savages as they call them quote unquote right and they went back to like really like talking about themselves like we are the black caribs it's hard it's hard i, I think that by the mid mid 18th century they already had this some sort of a, a self self-identity or self-recognition of themselves as these the black caries or or Noir, yeah well, it had been a, 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 at least a full century of development by then, right? Exactly, uh, but at the same generation. time, yeah, this yeah. is this are, this, are, this process takes a lot of time. It's not like from one day to another, but you can no. actually track the the differences, like the how how they are portrayed and how they portray themselves uh, when you see these interactions between colonial officials and indigenous and Afro indigenous people in the in the archive, for example. Yeah, another question. Now, this one's from Heather Freud. Freund. Um, was there a relationship 
that you've been able to find between the Caribs and runaway slaves. Of course, yeah. Yeah. I mean, even, even maybe in very it's a very complex story. It's a very complex story, and it depends on the political moments. At mm. some point, at some point, this the black Arif people, for example, uh, in, in the context of the American Revolution, that they mm. had own war against the British called the First Carib War. They welcome they welcome Maroons because they needed warriors. But when they needed weapons, when they needed assistance, they captured these this, this people in the, in the British plantation and sold them to the French in order to get weapons and get provisions. So it's a very complex story with these Africans Maroons. I, they are, of course, they welcomed them by ritual adoption and they, they, they had kids. Uh, it's a process of cultural transformation, but at the same time, these people were also slave traders. They capitalized on the Africanization of the slave trade and were able to establish these slave markets with different colonial powers. Mm. Okay. Uh, a question now from uh, Lance Parker, who uh, identifies himself as a fellow Mellon fellow. Uh, he works on Black Caribs as well in, oh, great. Uh, in Garifuna. Yeah. Uh, he's wondering um about land how sacred was he says he uses the word sacred how sacred was land to the caribs in these island cultures well that's a great question lance and i about the sacredness of this uh i have no how, how can i say evidence of their how is the the spiritual uh, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. transcendental perception of land ownership for them yeah. But what we can tell out of the like evident evidence in the archive is like let's let's quote like the British. They say like these Carib people are so jealous about their land. They say that uh -huh. over and over again, especially in Saint Vincent. They are so jealous about their land. They don't want us there. So uh -huh. they repel them. Any attempt of surveying these lands was repelled by these uh, indigenous and Afro-indigenous warriors. Unfortunately, I don't have evidence of of let's say the metaphysical or transcendental uh, conceptions of land ownership. Right, land, right. Land them. But so, they are so. such agricultural people, hence the right. land is right. life. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Which leads me to Ed Ruggemer's question here, uh, as, as usual, a very rich kind of historiographical question from Ed. Uh, he's asking about your slide that features agriculture. Uh, uh, with three women working with a mortar yeah. and a pestle. He's yeah. wondering how you read that. Is that rice production, he's asking? And if it is, what do you see in that image? If that is rice, this is Ed, how does this align with Judith Carney's argument yeah. about the African origins of rice production? Aha! Uh, actually, was rice already indigenous in those islands? Actually, I have to, I, I, I have to uh, undermine such a, such a great, uh, <laughs> such a great possibility because it's manioc, it's manioc. Manioc, okay. Yeah, they uh, made like this manioc bread and women were in okay. charge of, of, of producing that, which is actually how they like cultivated yeah. this cassava, cassava bread maniocs and they scratch it and put it together and bake it. But yeah. uh, but of course, women women were were in charge of of not only their the gardens right. agricultural production but also producing food, so that's yeah. why these these warriors they really like it to tour to the, to time when they raided different different not only indigenous enemies but also like the English and French they always capture the kids and women. So you're not tipping the Carney thesis overboard. Uh, but but Ed has that eye where he wondered if that's rice. Oh my God, what do we do with that thesis? You know, that's interesting. Yeah, that would be great, but no, no unfortunately, <laughs> that's not. Perhaps I find evidence later on that is like, oh, yeah. we also had rice, but good. Not well, at this. Point. Spoken like a true scholar, you you you, <laughs> you know what you find or what you don't find. Exactly. Uh, questions that keep flowing in, my man. David Nachman asks: Are there Black Carib communities we would recognize today? Uh, and if so, where uh, are people active in the recovery of their history and heritage and culture? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think that Lance Parker was working in this, the people Garifuna, the uh, who are descendants of the Black Carib people that uh, live today in, in what is the Bay of Honduras, in part of Belize, mm -hmm. Nicaragua, 
mm. on the Honduras and, and the Atlantic coast of Guatemala. These are the people that the British relocated there in 1796. They are in 1797. And of course, some, the majority of them, uh, this is a complex story, but there is evidence that people in Dominica and somehow in San Vincent identify themselves as Kalinago or Caripuna. Mm. And these people today call themselves the uh, Gari, Garinagu or Garifuna, which is like the phonetic evolution of these terms, mm. you know? But they are still there and they have a, there is people, uh, I don't remember his name, uh, anthropologists, many of them working on this spiritual connection actually between these islands, especially Romains and Vincent and what is today like Central America. So there is a sort of a, not only a recognition that they come from there, they still conserve the Arawak language, for example, the Garifuna, uh -huh. like base, Arawak base language, but also like some religious and cultural traditions, the uh, gender roles, they have all this, some sort of like cultural, because cultural change over time, but actually they see themselves yeah. as the descendants of these Afro-Indigenous people relocated uh, from the Lesser Antilles. So yeah, yeah, there is, there is a connection. Maybe because of bread too. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, I don't, <laughs> foodways are always part of this story. Yeah. Well, yeah. Sp again, uh, on, on the spiritual side here, Phil Miller asks, uh, speaking of sacred, he says, how does Christianity intersect uh, right. over time? Since you, right. I mean, I would just add to that, you're dealing with such a long period of time here. Is there is there a Christian story that evolves, say, by the 18th century among Black Caribs? I don't know. Yeah, we have we have several attempts to to to, to make a sort of a spiritual con conquest of these uh, indigenous uh, people. Yeah. The first were the the, the French, uh, the Jesuits and Domini Dominicans, like uh, Father Breton, for example. He had like some, some sort of a mission there in Dominica. Yeah. The results of these missions very very uh, poor, to be general, uh -huh. very uh -huh. poor. Uh -huh. I think that uh, the, uh, the evidence I have is like this, uh, these indigenous people, they embrace Christianity as a way of, of manipulating the Europeans more. Mm. Mm. They will get baptized, but, oh. they will not, but they will not leave aside their own traditions, you know, like their own tradition, the culture of the ancestors, and yeah. they, they believe in the, some sort of a spiritual realm of the ancestor that they conserve that all the time. So... Mm -hmm. I will say that they they manipulated also. <laughs> well, that's uh, almost always happens when religions collide and powers involved. Uh, God, that's fascinating. Uh, our colleague here, Ann Eller, asks. Right. Uh, you got a big audience today, Ernesto. This is this that's is great. great. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. He tells you first. It's a wonderful presentation. Uh, what does your research tell us? She's asking about small boat travel in the Caribbean. Right. I mean, what have you uncovered about that uh, between these islands? Is it, is it hard to find evidence of small vessel travel or what have you, um, actually, what have you found on that? This is how everybody got around in small boats. Yeah, but actually one of the elements that really like made these, these Carif and Black Carif people so powerful is that they had their own like seafaring traditions and technologies. Mm. They didn't rely on European, any sort of technology or anything. They had their own pirogues. They moved around the islands. They had their own navigation techniques. They were able to navigate all the lesser Antilles in these small boats and mobilize mm. warriors in those pirogues, attack the British, attack the French. And mm. so, yeah, this is more like an archipelagic geography of contact where these right. indigenous and Afro-indigenous people were able to not only trade, but also forge political alliances and go, go into warfare. But the element of the sea here is crucial. It's crucial. Uh, we have a question here from Erica Zuniga, who mm -hmm. says, and I'll just read it what it says and you can respond. Uh, I am Garifuna, a descendant from the Kalinago. Right. It says, Black Caribs is a term coined by the British for us. We were never enslaved. Therefore, we were never Afro-Indigenous slaves. The picture shows cassava, not rice, uh, et cetera, uh, which you already pointed out. Uh, how do you respond to that 
claim. I, I I never say that they were enslaved. I never say that they yeah. that that's the first thing I say. They were like free people. They were never enslaved. And I already say why I use the term Carib and Black Carib. I know that there are impositions from the colonial mm -hmm. archive and mm -hmm. colonial perspective. But at the same time, we cannot just whip out the political implications of that of, of that terminology. And I'm, I'm saying today, well, this is the Kalinago people. That's how they refer to themselves, to each other, at least the evidence of Dominica and St. Vincent. And the element of Af uh, uh, the African element, I just say they had welcome runaways. They married intermarried with African descendants. So I don't know. I, I think that I'm just repeating verbatim what he say in other words, or, or at least like paraphrasing. I don't and think that's very here. You're very straightforward about the fact that they too became slave traders. This was part of the. There is the, the evidence is there. Of the Atlantic. Uh, the evidence is there. Uh, that's not something I'm making up. Uh, that's, no, no, no. I, I'm not suggesting you did. I just think you know that that has to be. You're very straightforward about that. It seems. Man, the questions just keep flying in here. Um, let's see. Oh, here's a question from Dini Alethianani. Uh, Ernesto, could you speak more about <laughs> the inclusive notions of kinship right. in Black Carib societies and the implications of that, the kinship tradition? Yeah, that's very interesting, and that has a lot of ramic ramifications because kinship for them was not only a way of like like blood related, yeah, also like establish a commercial alliance. For example, it is very evident with the French people. Uh, right. They call them, for example, they call them, they, they adapted the French word compère. Uh -huh. Like compère uh -huh. colleague in order to say like, well, this is the, the, the political alliance that we have here. Something interesting that I found with several different sources is that this Carib and Black Carib, they never refer to other people like by their names. Because oh. that's, that's taboo for them. They refer to them like through the terms or their kinship ties. Uh-huh. For uh -huh. example, a Carib leader never say, I don't know, like Juan, Jean, Jean, Jean Baptiste, Juan, uh, Chatoya, never say uh, uh, Monfer or my nephews. Uh -huh. For uh -huh. example, these are the notions of in inclusive kinship that I'm talking about that go a little bit beyond the bloodlines. So identity was as much relationships as it was names. Exactly. Exactly. Uh -huh. They never call to each other about their by their given names. Yeah. About, wow. But about the, the term of the kinship term that relate them. Yeah. Uh, here's a question from Stuart Schwartz, our colleague here. Oh, of um, yeah. Uh, thanks, Stuart. Uh, he says, you have no mention here of yellow caribs. Right. Now, you can take yeah. that wherever you want. He says, uh, and he's uh, this is Stuart. He's saying, you know, your your project needs a little. Well, in a longer version, it might have, but project needs a little more attention to chronological change over time, since you're dealing with such a vast period of time. Right. And maybe more. Can you tell us maybe more about their removal in 1797, first to Honduras and even to Nova Scotia? It's amazing. So there's a there's like a Carib diaspora of some sort. I, I'm I'm I, um, extrapolating yeah, well, that from Stuart's question, but anyway, the, yellow caribs chronological change. Take that whatever, however you want. Let's start with the the so-called yellow caribs again. Like we we go to the 17, 1750s to the seventeen nineties. Of course, this is a moment of history where the Africanization of slavery and the racialization of slavery is there already established. So, welcoming runaway slaves and having like this sort of relationship with people of African descent was a decision that every Carib, Carbet or family did. Some people didn't welcome them. And that was like a personal decision of each leader. So for, from the, again, from the European perspective, some of these Carib people look black and other of them didn't look, at, and, and this is very weird and very awkward, I know, but for the from the European perspective, some of them look more native. Mm. So they 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 coin this term yellow caribs. Sometimes they call it also like the red caribs. Uh-huh. Okay. Wow. And they portray, yeah, and they portray like they are a minority still in St. Vincent, 
at the, at the moment of the 1780s, 1790s. But these are just colonial categories that emerge in the archive. Mm. But of course, it tells more about like the European and colonial perception of culture and race than about the geopolitical or political relationship that these people had with each other. Because the evidence showed that these so-called yellow and black caribs also were establishing alliances, had their own differences, political differences, yeah. but as any other carib leader had with any other carib leader. Wow. This is complex. No, uh, here, yeah. <laughs> all right, here, here's a viewer, uh, Joseph Sony Jean, who wants to challenge, it appears, oh. your use of the term slave traders. He's He's wondering if that expression is really correct for the Caribs. Uh, his suggestion here is that I think what he's saying is the slave trade is introduced by Europeans. Uh, I don't know. How do you respond to that, that the black Caribs were not actual slave traders? No, I think that the, the, the point is well taken. The point is well taken. What I'm talking here is about the African slave trade in general. Yeah. The conception of these indigenous people is not necessarily as slaves. But as captives, uh huh. Okay. Captives, captivity is something different to slavery, as perceived by Europeans. Captivity is not like is not passed through generations. For example, captivity right. is not like the uh, like captives are not like such an object of, of production and, and humiliation and, and uh -huh. suffering as in European plantations. But at the same time, and this is something we cannot just like sweep out, these captives that the Caris had were sold to other Europeans. And when yeah. they were sold to other Europeans, they were enslaved. Right. Okay. So of course, they are they are participating in the slave trade, even though they are selling captives or exchanging captives by for guns, ammunition, wine, or something or whatever they need at that point. But of course, I, I want to make I want to really like uh, emphasize that the conceptions of slavery and captivity are totally different. Well, that's something that in my book, I, I of course, <laughs> going to <laughs> stress very well. You know, this really, I, I, I still questions are flowing. This is an amazing audience. Um, and and it, it's, it's clear to me, clear to all of us here, that there's a real politics here to this story of the Caribs over time especially this expansive time, politics to the words you use describing them, their activities, is it slave trading, is it not, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, kudos to you, Ernesto. You're wading into a, a world here that is uh, complex. Well, we all have complex worlds to wade into. Uh, but uh, you sure you certainly have here. And can you say a word here before we stop um, about just, I mean, I don't want you to have to defend the originality of your own work, but but it appears here that you've you're tackling something that is not easy to find, but you're finding a lot out about it. Now there are other people doing this, but is this still a fairly nascent field of really getting to the bottom of the nature of Carib cultures, the contacts and connections and entanglements with the European powers, and then all these economic, social, and political dimensions of it over two and a half to three centuries. Is this, is this the beginning of a kind of Carib studies that we just haven't seen much before? Well, I hope that is the, well, it's not the first work. I mean, like Tessa Murphy's work yep. also deals with some aspects of this, even though oh, yeah. the, he's yeah. focusing more on the region than on the on these people in particular. But I, what my hope is just like, I mean, something we talked when we were having lunch the other day, David, yeah. like when you go to the archive and you are just looking to mercantilism and you are just looking at numbers of enslaved people yeah. coming from Africa, that's all that you find. Like when you go there and start looking at these agents, political agents, so-called caris or black yeah. caris, where you find a lot of evidence there. Right. So what I hope is that this work that I'm working on, like opens not only not only here in the lesser Antilles, but also in North and South America, for example, works by, with the Taino Indians, or we can talk about the Tainos again uh, in great in the Greater Antilles and so on. But I think that. We can say something just to close. It's just like we need to take indigeneity and the political 
participation of indigenous and Afro-Indigenous people in the Antilles and the Caribbean seriously? Well, uh, <laughs> uh, this has been a great talk. I'm going to have to cut us off. Pretty. There's another response here from Stuart Schwartz. So you and Stuart have to get together. I would uh, love to. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll try to set that up if Stuart doesn't call you first. I hope he does. Uh, there are even new questions from people who have already asked questions. Uh, you have really stimulated a fascinating discussion here. I, I can only imagine how much fun this would have been in person. Uh, but thank God we had a huge audience here today, Ernesto. Uh, so let me just thank you here for an incredible stimulating talk and discussion. And Michelle put in the uh, chat or Q&A, uh, your email and how you can be reached. I hope you don't regret yeah, that. I'm welcome. Uh, <laughs> because a lot of people here have other questions it's for great. you. That would be great. It's always good. And so forth. And yeah. you may have developed a little network here of, of Carib research. I hope that's the case. Uh, we, we love having you here, Ernesto. And, uh, and we're glad we still have you another two or two and a half or three weeks or whatever it is. Stay as long as you can. Uh, thank you all for coming today. It's been a great audience and a great talk. And thanks for all the questions. I didn't quite get to every question. I'm sorry about that, but they, they just kept coming fast and furious. Uh, Ernesto, uh, muchas gracias and uh, I'll see you soon. And thank you all for coming. Uh, next week, by the way, I'm doing a conversation with Marjolene Cars. Uh, who was last year's co-winner of the Frederick Douglass Prize. That's, I believe, Wednesday of next week. I think I have that right. Uh, on her book, uh, Blood in the Water. Um, uh, a uh, not so well-known slave insurrection that occurred in Suriname. Uh, Marjolene will be on, we'll do a live conversation about that book, which we always try to do with last year's Douglas Prize winners. Uh, so anyway, Ernesto, thank you and thank you all for attending. Thank you very much.